so it begins. Hello everyone, welcome to tonight's live stream. If you're tuning in, it's an honor to speak. I want to begin speaking about a concept where many times a sort of emotional purpose in my experience has been driven from it and what I uh, you know what I've decided to kind of call this concept for this talk is the ropes of hope now the ropes of hope are the moments in a person's life where there is a percentage like there's more than 50 percent inefficiency and this inefficiency, it will, the more inefficiency enters the lifetime, the more the person feels. The more the person feels they need to kind of be pulled towards efficiency. It's uh, kind of the other side of the spectrum for the mind in a certain condition. Now, when I bring up the concept of redesigning, that's very crucial because there's two, two sorts of design I consider, two modes of design. One, you ex externally design something. Uh, the other is internally you shift your approach to the same external design. What that means is, for example, I'm bilingual, I can speak English and Farsi. When I look at a chair, you know, it's, uh, it's a chair, but also a sandali, which is the Persian word for it. So, so what I'm trying to say is like the inner reality can project multiple designs on one objective phenomena. The simple reason is the inner reality is changing much quicker than the outer reality because the inner reality is due to attention. The true nature of the inner reality is not subjective at all. Most people feel that if they go behind their eyes, you know, what they will find is thoughts, thoughts kind of moving in some abyss of space. You know, like an invisible room where imagination exists in. Whether we like it or not. <coughs> time will catch up to us. It will remind us of how we are existing. It will shake us. The ropes of hope uh, is a sort of backup system, and I, when I kind of looked at the civilization, it became very clear to me. Uh, the approach can't, there is only a certain thing, a few things that the civilization can do, few, few major things. The first thing is to recognize the value of a global community, to, to in some sense, uh, it's as if, like, think of it this way, your parents, your guardians, uh, brought you into this world. They created you in some sense. And in some sense, the child that has been created now is trying to, is attempting to recreate the creator. What this means is that if this is something I find very hilarious in the New Age community, it happens without people realizing. The dude goes to search for truth. And the New Age community, the guy's like, wow, this data is new to me. I'm going to run. And the, and the guy runs in the fields of the New Age, pondering a sort of truth. The thing is, the issue is that when you want something from external reality, you can get so instantly deceived. There must come an ability to once attempting civilization like the day throughout the day i don't know why people like i don't understand why shyness stress and depression exist it's like we're on a rock in the middle of nowhere coming to terms with it you know once we recognize that we are alone we are on an island called this planet 
and we have created our, our our knowledge and everything on this island we will in some sense feel very alone there's two types of loneliness there's a loneliness where the person's not with the community the person's like i'm so alone <laughs> but then there is another loneliness it's a sort of divine loneliness this divine loneliness finds you. It has to do with your karmic structure. It has to do with how things at first in your life are leaving you. You know, there are some children born in, uh, in chaotic situations, in situations where th what they are dependent on goes away sooner than they expect. And so the child is thrown in some sense into a mode of reality where the chaos is not holding back. You see, if somebody's a good person, you ask them to stop, they will stop. If somebody is a bad person, you ask them to stop, they will actually uh, uh, do the opposite, go quicker in, in, in their process of destruction. <clears throat> Redesigning the ropes of hope is a suggestion that we will eventually, as a civilization, right now I'm speaking in 2019, I feel in the next kind of like 20 years, I'll give it 20 to 100 years. What's going to happen is going to there's going to be a development of a global, uh, re, uh, like think of it this way. Uh, what, do, what do we find the United Nations? We find separate nations uh, in one room for a moment. They're united. They're talking to one another. The thing is that all these separate organizations will wonder about their meaning. I find it's not just uh, when, when I, the first time I noticed that a business, like a, an actual business, businesses have life cycles. And the attempt of the entrepreneur is a sort of trying to keep the business immortal. As the business has a life cycle, therefore the intentions that move that organization uh, have to confront a sort of temporary spectrum where the, in regards to how the values would change. So, if humanity found itself, found itself for the first time Valuing collect collective efficient methods over individually inefficient methods. That is how the world will turn. We have to design uh, not just externally but internally an alertness and awareness to reality. Right now as I'm speaking to you, the only reason I can speak is because I gaze upon this vast cosmos and the, I come to a certain checkpoint of it. And then I share that checkpoint. Every day I have awoken on this planet, I have looked at the world and I'm like, world, what is it that you haven't told me yet? What, have it, what is it that you haven't shown me? And there's been times where I've had my mind has entered heaven before my body. And so in some sense, it's, very, it's a very strange state because you cry and laugh at the same time as if there's tears of joy uh, falling from one eye and from the other eye, tears of sorrow. And so this tears of sorrow is about the inevitable condition of human existence, but this inevitable condition of human existence poses itself as an opportunity. Someone asked if somebody wants sugar in their coffee. <clears throat> the guy said, no, I don't like sugar. And the person was like, what do you mean you don't like sugar? And he's like, I don't like sweet lies. This life can be very convincing. I have met people that my first impression of them, I felt they were incredible people. Later on, I began to see their inner strength was so weak that they changed as the environment changed. It's as if they had not found who they were. The environment was telling them who they were. And because the environment were telling them who, who, who they were and because each kind of spiritual people, they, they banish the ego. They're trying to exile or destroy the ego. They're like, your ego is your biggest problem, man. Get rid of it and then you'll be enlightened. <laughs> like the ego is a hat to throw away. 
you know, for me, the ego is a technology. Since childhood, I was fascinated by technology. Technology was, in some sense, another way the life of the world moved in my eyes. And so when I began, it took me a while. You don't understand. It took me maybe like 20 years to suddenly notice this. Notice the programs of culture and civilization being based on the program of language and the program of language being purely defined by the program of action in regards to how the attention is kept. So pretty much I, I, I thought that I was a sense of self. I thought I could define myself. I thought, like if I said my real name is Amin, you know, this Mr. Within is an alias. But uh, and it, uh, when I really looked at who I was, I wasn't convinced by who I thought I was. And because I wasn't convinced by my thoughts, because I commanded, I shouted at my thoughts, how are you here? And then I saw my memories. You know, it's only when it's like the edge of reality is, believe it or not, it's ed it has two edges. One edge you can never reach. It's the e endless, like if we made a rocket ship and just flew at the speed of life till the edge of the cosmos. Like one, one situation would be like that. <clears throat> Another situation is that the edge of the world is actually behind your eyes. It is how far your memory keeps it here. And the relationship of imagination, the relationship of memory, the relationship of the human being with the language that classifies the world into various ways. Once we understand this, we have a better ability to function in the world. It is not about everybody going into a cave and getting enlightenment. That is mass confusion. There were some people in history who had to do that. Like, I totally understand why the Buddha had to just sit under a tree. But, but on, on some level, the commands of the era are different. 2019 is not 2,000 years ago, you know? More than 2,000 years ago, you know? 2,000 years ago, I believe Islam opened its eyes in the world. 2,500 years ago, Christianity opened its eyes in the world. Three, I think 3,000 to 3,500 years ago, Buddhism opened its eyes in the world. And before that, men, there were many, and after that, there were many. The thing is that we are in a symbiosis with a sort of linguistic simulation. When we don't realize this, we are yet defined by the linguist, linguistic simulation. What that means is if you were sitting somewhere and somebody came up to you and was like, Hey, man, and incredibly insulted you. Usually people would take the insult at heart. They'd be like, how dare this person speak to me? Does this person not know who I am? And da-da-da-da-da begin, begins the stomps of giants, you know. <clears throat> and so there's one approach like that where you, the words that enter your sphere of awareness are literally simulated by your mind. And this is why people with great imaginations get offended quickly. <laughs> I'm telling you. Nothing, <laughs> people with incredible imaginations get offended quickly because unless they recalibrate their relationship with the linguistic simulation, the subjective realm, and just pretty much how language is being the world for them. <clears throat> the reason is because the moment the words enter the ears of the person, their imagination is so uh, alert that instantaneously it animates it. There's been times where I've just been sitting, I haven't even been paying attention, but I've kind of like my ears picked up certain things people behind me were saying. Literally like behind me I was standing in line and suddenly it's as if I wasn't even thinking about what they were saying, but their words suddenly entered the scope of my imaginative kind of uh, animation of it. So, so what I'm trying to say is that really you can't control the contents of your mind. If somebody comes and shouts in front of you, you cannot ignore it, like you can't lock your ears unless you see that you know the guy's going to shout and then you lock your ears but you tend to it, it seems like the kind of intelligent beings we are our reception to the external world is really open that means i am at least there was a time i i looked at these ancient yogic texts and there were some yogis who were really extreme they were so extreme that <laughs> i was like holy shit like it was it was like their, their extremeness was in the sense that they saw the material reality, the objective realm, as an illusion. Because it was an illusion, they in some sense felt they had to get out of an illusion, never realizing that the illusion and the truth are codependent. <laughs> that means in a changing world, to have too many truths, it's kind of like, uh, you know, 
choosing to never cut your hair. You can choose not to, but the belief will gain weight over time. Beliefs gain weight because they are hiding you. It's as if the parent is like, imagine, like some beliefs can be very good. Some beliefs can be the opposite. But the ultimate efficiency lies in the recal like realignment of a direct experiencer with an indirect kind of creative ability to uh, subjectify the whole world. There's a scene in this uh, anime show by the name of Attack on Titan. For me, stories are fascinating, so I uh, characters in a story are very real to my mind. That means if whatever the show is showing, I can imagine myself in the eyes of that, like in, in the shoes of that character, and then I react to the story. You see, because in some sense you have to enter a reality before you can appreciate it if a person doesn't know certain values for example they give they put a mathematical equation in front of you if you have no idea what the symbology what that language in front of you means you have no way of in some sense handling it or kind of communicating reality is by the nature of it being change uh, a changing phenomena there is the implication that in some sense, <clears throat> in some sense, you cannot really change a world that is changing. You can just consciously navigate in it. I find that before we are human beings, we are moments of attention that, due to the uh, origination of the free will, have a sort of navigating ability. I feel the free will is a technology that was suddenly invented in the attention of this phenomena. This free will me meant that in, in a universe where, guys, whether we like it or not, when you look at the religious perspective and you just look at it on an ideology level, that means you forget all the emotions you have about the concept and you just look at the design of the concept. You see, the design of the context is in some sense that um, God, uh, in a religious notion, uh, God is uh, uh, the source of all phenomena, yet it is also within all phenomena and it is the mover of all phenomena. Right, pretty much religions were like a catalog for the demonstration that reality is under the governance of a collective being. Okay, so what that means is the religious man, in some sense, uh, religion is a sort of uh, ego diffusing mechanism because the person is always considering that the, the truth of the other is, is the reality. You know, when you are a creation of God, you will never give yourself as much freedom as God gave itself. So what I'm trying to say is that it's a, it's a, it's a relationship design-wise where the, it's like God was a metaphor, uh, was, a pers was a personifying personification of nature, the overall movement of nature, the overall intelligence of nature. Okay, and this began with a sort of polytheistic setting. Eventually, it came to a singular position as if God, uh, God moved from objects, uh, from many objects, uh, and from a singular object to suddenly uh, 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 many thoughts. That means people looked at the clouds and they saw many gods. And at the same time, it, from the many gods, it came to a singular one. A singular one which was the overall origin of the origin. Pretty much our intelligence as a human being had an ability to uh, wonder about the regression of the causes of the effects that we find ourselves in. You see, the person is being controlled by the laws of nature. The laws of nature by the person, religious texts, you, get, you fi find yourself under the impression that we are, in some sense, the imagination of God. We are God's mind. We are, we are, we are a simulation, instant simulation uh, of, of a dimension beyond.
life is something that uh, you gotta acknowledge it in the proper way or it won't acknowledge you. It's strange. If somebody asks me, who am I? I can give them a few sentences, yet my true, true conclusion is that I am nothing that I observe beyond. That's it. You look in the mirror, you suddenly see yourself, okay? And this sense of self is so conditional, that means it's like, like without gravity, nobody's face would look like the way it does. The conditions of the world appear as very unique. In ancient times, self-inquiry was not something that people would have to advise. It was something natural. The thing is, the technological revolution kind of... It's, it made our lives easier, but perhaps it made it too easy. It made us content with the easiness of life, rather than adapting uh, to the evolutionary circumstance. We, in some sense, are kind of like, we, I feel we're a species not from this planet. It has to be something like this, because when you look at all other species, their evolutionary intent is limited. Now, there can be explanations. We can say we had the head start as a species. That's why we're so evolved. And there's even uh, philosophers, I, I don't remember their names, but I remember reading the articles. Like, there's, there's certain philosophers who've kind of con contemplated that it's like the evolution that the ape went, all the other animals will go to. All living phenomena will eventually reach a point where an attention will awaken to a selfhood. This sense of selfhood is eventually moved into a sort of linguistic simulation. So they are like, uh, nobody has said it, I think, like the way I'm saying. But it, it's like I say the purpose of matter was to be beyond matter. It's like the purpose of the caterpillar was to be a butterfly. The purpose of objective reality was to be a subjective movement.
every moment, uh, if you're an individual, conscious, idea-oriented creature, it is conditional. To learn to handle the conditional means that the condition changes and as you acknowledge as you acknowledge change you notice before even in the process of the life of the human being it's born and it dies in the middle of that kind of lifetime that journey of a lifetime there is so many things changing so many factors entering the attention and leaving the attention that in some sense from the moment we are born we have in some sense known we have known of change and so it's kind of like when Heraclitus says something like uh, a, no man can step in the same river twice and it is not the same river and it is not the same man, you know. What he means by, there, <laughs> by that, he means that in every moment where your attention had formu has formulated the sense of self based on that moment, it's been a new self. So what that means is uh, Heraclitus, I could totally see his notion of a, like it's very obvious this philosopher had a metaphys metaphysical perspective simply because there was something watching change as it changed. That something that is watching change as it changes is actually attributeless. Because it is attributeless, the linguistics, uh, the subjective aspect of the moment cannot explain it. And that's the wonder. <clears throat> so in some sense, there is a view it's one person living and dying, or there is a view as if there is one moment, and in every moment that it is dynamic, in its waking state, it is, it is being defined by where it steps into. The conditions of reality simply have navigation as a part of it, pretty much in this life. If you think only objectively, it's very easy. The rest of your life, you just navigate. You go from different rooms of manifestation and meaning, and in some sense, you try to ignore the truth because it, it's unnecessary to see the ultimate. But then eventually realize the whole lifetime who will ask the question if the question, in some sense, has to do with the inner reality of the being. For me, what happened is I started, it's as if like I was thrown, like a comet, like an asteroid, kind of. I think a comet doesn't reach the surface of the Earth, but an asteroid, like an asteroid hitting the Earth. It's as if I was thrown into a field of data. This field of data, as the creature evolves and gets a sense of itself, uh, it eventually becomes like waves. Like one day you wake up, life happens in one wave. And then you wake up another day, and again, it's like another wave of data is hitting you, another condition, of, like factors are hitting you. You know, and so the dexterity, or let me say it like this, the concentration, how attention is watching the singular, a single point, that's where you attain the state of seeing the glitch in the system. You pretty much become Neo, like watching a spoon bend and being like, holy shit, spoons can bend that way. In some of my earlier talks, I spoke about conscious design, which means the free will validates itself through movement. A part of your intelligence is only defined by how it changes, so because it needs change, you have to move. Any person who doesn't move in this reality, I mean, you can choose to sit still, like there's some yogis who sat still for three years, three months, and three days. Like they would go into certain samadhis where the body would no longer be governed by the conditions of the objective belief, the way objective reality has been believed. And so the body actually finds itself in a neutral kind of ambivalence, in a neutral state, where in that neutral state there is no condition. It's as if the battle between, like, your, <clears throat> your mind right now is fighting the unknown. 
the edges of your knowledge meet the edges of the unknown, right? And so it's one of those situations where like the old school flat earth view that life was kind of earth was like just a flat field, okay? And as if it was a flat field, Because it was a sort of flat field, at the edge of the ocean, there's this notion of a ship. Imagine a wooden old school ship, like back in the day. And this ship is going from the edge of this flat earth ocean into empty space. And it's, it's one of those situations where all that the person is being known is being challenged by themselves. It's as if you become your teacher before anybody can teach you. That's kind of like how looking in, in, a tr in a clear mirror is like. Life is very integrative and the nature is, it's the intelligence that does this. That tree doesn't need to relate to the soil, but because we, the observers beyond that dynamic, see the tree is dependent on the soil, suddenly it's integrative. And the whole exploration of knowledge is bring is like literally humanity or every human being their attention is like a flashlight and this world is like a dark forest and we're kind of looking and seeing various different things discovering various parts you know kind of uh exploring reality this method of exploration is a suggestion that how would i say to you like because we explore, we bring back. Think of it as a tribe, and member of the tribe suddenly found apples and brought apples to the tribe, and the whole tribe was like, holy shit, there's apples. You know? <laughs> and... <coughs> <coughs> suddenly, the whole tribe had access to apples. Another person would go find the lemon tree, and suddenly, when life gives you lemons, you pretty much share it. with the tribe. It's kind of like drops being added to the ocean, you know? That's kind of like how explorations and extra ex ex excavations from the unknown feel like, you know? The issue is the intelligence of the human being, it requires games. And you begin to see all the dimensions of life are various games you're playing at different existential sensitivities. Your physical survival is a game of continuing the atomic existence. You know, love or relationships or just getting, in some sense, move, marching with your species towards advancement. Like all these things, they have to do with your relationship with your mind. And your mind is not just a bundle of thoughts and memories. Your mind is a living moment. Do you understand the importance of that? Imagine you just saw a phoenix in front of you and you were like, wow, this phoenix is flying in my backyard. You know? <laughs> and so at the same time, at the same time, you begin to see just like how that thought, if it was real, would be intense. You begin to see how your mind is being your moment with the same amount of awe. Like there will come a moment in every human being's life where they will be fascinated by themselves. If they are stressed and depressed, that's because that time has not come or that time has come and their person's not seeing it. The issue, the, I say inefficient system, oh my God, when you go try to see the big picture, you will see so many inefficient systems that you may even conclude life to be a failure from the start. But that is arrogance. That is arrogance, not ignorance. It is arrogance because the person is convinced is convinced by their view <clears throat> sometimes i've had a thought and i've like I, like i literally sat down and i thought about it i'm like okay let me just 
would it make sense if a person wants to be right all the time? Would it make sense if a person is wrong all the time? And I realize it's impossible. This is the issue with intelligence. Just like how, this is why I say the guy who made the IQ test has a very low IQ. <laughs> and let me tell you why I'm saying that. Okay, because that person thought a piece of paper could reflect the totality of the ability of the intelligence of the person. It is not so. The, that test, that IQ test, is your whole lifetime. And you will never know until the breath has decided to move beyond the cloud. Certain poets, their, their poetry was a sort of natural inspiration for them. That means they saw nature in ways where they were pulled by it. You see, that's when I find not everybody on this planet should be a writer. Let me tell you why. Because it will diminish the value of words. But at the same time, I believe everybody should write. Everybody should write, but it's like we have the, the whole backup, the backup system to civilization, if there comes an extinction situation, will not just be the preservation of the physical bodies of the human being, but the knowledge, the wisdom of the species. And so the wisdom of the species is accumulated to a sort of position where we're all acknowledging civilization, a sort of vehicle we are born into. You know, and to ignore it is wrong and to just only be in it is wrong as well. It's like there's no correct way to ride a surfboard. You got to look at the dynamic of the environment and kind of just ride the waves. You got to trust the living intelligence. And many children, because their, their sense of ideological self is dependent on their environment, that's kind of like how the child is raised. It's like the child has to detach that sense of self and recreate that sense of self with a new contentment of who they are in that moment. Okay? And the thing is, life is much more wiser than the human being. And because I'm saying this, that means everything I'm saying stands in awe of nature's intelligence, which moves in ways where I am totally convinced it is unfathomable. It moves beyond the language threshold, a concept I've created to represent that uh, there we, we, the human being can have experiences which cannot be contained by language simply because the words have not been created for it. Life totally shifts in the way it happens for you when you acknowledge a, a unique, unknown presence to life that must be respected. Respect doesn't mean agree. Respect means allow. Sometimes we realize, like when I see political correctness, I, you know what I realize political correctness is a symptom of? Political cor correctness is a symptom of how isolated and lonely people are. They are so isolated and lonely where they, their, their attention goes on the language of the person rather than on who the person is. And that's a sort of madness. I don't know what the true proper solution is. I believe it's some sort of kind of, there needs to be a global community that invites all human beings who care for life to kind of, I feel there should be a global community that gives the problems, the hardest problems of the world as a quest to be solved with a big financial compensation. Like, I don't know if many billionaires know what to do with their money, but if I personally was a billionaire, I would instantly start making educational systems that in some sense pay the student rather than take money from the student. And the student's going to be like, what? The educational system is paying me to study? You know, not only will I get good grades, I'm going to be rich. <laughs> So many kids want to be rich. I swear, if you make education 
uh, have financial compensation, the child will become, our species will become so smart. Because think about it, we have egoic desires to be rich at the same time uh, we are in educational systems that are taking money away from us. So the person, I like I will tell you, the way educational systems are designed, I will feel many people will hate knowledge. They will just hate their experience of higher education simply because it was very isolated. It was like a passenger on a roller coaster rather than the one being there to rebuild the future roller coasters. You see, it's like the educational system. It is healthy when the minds of the people in, in class are healthy. And the minds of the student in class, of course, like you got to sit down, hear the students explain these concepts you've never heard before and just take it in and move on. Right. Like it's 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 very understandable, like what the educational system is doing. However, I feel it must also have additional initiatives, kind of a restructuring of the value of the student's mind. When the ch child daydreams, the teacher doesn't tell the child in some sense, uh, stop daydreaming, pay attention, kid, you know, slaps a ruler to the table like a madman. Like what kind of teacher does that? Like just use your words. You know? <laughs> and so. <clears throat> here's the thing here's the thing when the teacher doesn't care for the student the educational system becomes mechanical and it becomes the death of inspiration and so imagine the teacher when the kids daydreaming instead of the teacher being like don't daydream the teachers like hey kid you know, you were just daydreaming right now. How about you go sit on that table and literally write this daydream down for yourself? We in this educational system incredibly value imagination and any ability of a human being to choose to wonder that is more brilliant than any sort of regurgitation of a past belief. People forget this life. There's an exploration process going on. You can't be convinced too early because then you won't search. That's the issue with beliefs. Now, sometimes it doesn't mean the person should be obsessively searching for truth all, or not truth, but just for efficiency all the time. It, it means that you realize the value of life is in your presence and how you wield your attention defines the boundaries of behavior. <clears throat> the person's intelligence can be used like a shield and it can be used like a sword. And it can even have both of them at the same time. Let me tell you what I mean. It can be used as a sort of sword because it expresses. The sword attacks. The sword is the, sword is the first intention, is the exploration. But the shield is what it receives. The shield only exists to receive. So a part of your intelligence is receiving data like, like blows of a sword on this shield called your uh, knowledge on your awareness, on what you know so far is like a shield, kind of your rationality, your ability to see what is actually here, that is your shield. And so it constantly gets attacked by not only the change in the forces of nature, but in regards to the various ways that communication comes at you. For me, it's not just people that approach me, ideas approach me. And sometimes ideas approach me through people speaking and sometimes ideas approach me without there even being a person, just my, my, my mind kind of in some sense pulls out a design out of a design that's already there and does not own it. It took me a while to disown knowledge. It was, it was kind of in the back of in my subconscious building up as like this kind of egoic pride. I had to be comfortable to be the fool and it's like this is why uh, let me tell you the greatest wisdom on this world is revealed to the fool because the fool has let go of their conviction to see something new that's the thing none of people's beliefs are right or wrong they're just ideology that is affecting them and so I feel our species should wake up from the slumber of a global network on some level. We are seeing tiny percentage of its appearance through the internet, but it's not the internet. It has to do with the activity of human beings. It has to do with the freedom of how much the child that is born on this planet feels free they can be who they are. Because who they are could be what is needed in society right now. Shyness, weakness, fear, 
ignorance, all these are like a fence. They are a fence between your inner reality and outer reality, a subjective fence. And this fence, it must be crossed. You must, you must see beyond your own limitations to attain more of a limitless understanding of them. What evolution meant is nobody can be judged because everybody's evolving into something else. You know, like who, you judge somebody and tomorrow, oh my God, this person is the best person in the world. <laughs> the global community, this backup system I'm suggesting, it is dependent. It is dependent on how quick the greatest ideas or the required ideas from the mind of 8 billion people. We're not, it's not just an overpopulated rock where we're all going to, to our deaths. Like it's not just, that's not the only story that's more active here. We carry the beacons of the past without burning ourselves and without burning the world. We allow the future to not be, the future is always unknown. The past is known based on how much it is recorded and consciously accessible. You know, the past is known. It's like, okay, I know what happened there, you know, <laughs> but the future, who knows what's going to happen yet. It is all one moment's change. That means the biggest philosophical, one of the most ont important ontological questions is that who is here right now? Is it the intelligence of the whole universal sector as one phenomenon? Or is it one, one little thing, tiny thing, who's found itself in a vast thing? What is the actual relationship? It's honestly kind of a rebellion of honesty. It's like honesty is rebelliously being injected into society. Honesty means the approach of the human being to their humanity. Your humanity has two sides to the coin. One is your individual humanness, where you care about. The other is how the whole species is continuing. Do you not care for how you, you know, your, your, your species stands on this planet? You're telling me when I see violence on the streets, I'm like, this is, I, my heart breaks. Not because I'm like, oh my God, they're so evil. No, it's not like that. I don't have an emotional story like that. For me, it's because I am seeing inefficiency. What that means is that the same energy of those two human beings could be placed in a condition that could be much better. You see? And this follows the theory that chaos is external, but slowly from the abilities and the sophistication of the free will of the human being, it is getting pulled into civility as if civilization is like this kind of um, room we, we have built, uh, this bunker for all human beings. And we're like, listen, don't be like an animal and enter civilization and advance. Go see what your mind is. You know, that's kind of like uh, we, ha we, have to, we have to break the stories that are slowing us down. Michelangelo, this um, incredible Italian uh, artist and sculptor, he has this quote that is just incredible. Like his, his use of language was as incredible as his sculpting ability. And he was a great sculptor because of his precision, not because of his randomness, because of his precision. He was incredibly precise. He was like an advanced machine, as other people would see him probably. Right. And so Michelangelo, he has this quote where he says he's a sculptor, right? He says, I saw the angel in the stone and I set it free. He saw the efficient possibility. He saw something that the mind only saw. And then his body, in some sense, sculpted that subjective design into the objective design. Do you know how fascinating that is? That's kind of like the same way we suddenly put a thought over matter. Suddenly this, this object in front of me is a chair. Do you see? Suddenly I am me. Suddenly the world is filled with various categories. This is why I believe mathematical language must have come first before actual language. 
That means the first way human beings speak, uh, uh, the first sort of mathematical language, which was not per se their speech, but it was their comprehension. They saw one, two, three. They saw separate forms. So for me, it was first the evolution of a mathematical uh, awareness, which has to do with the duality of an individual in a world, right? And then from this subconscious mathematical structure of accepted reality, then came more sophisticated movements of, in some sense, language and poetry and literature. And so what I'm telling you is, it's, this is why I'm saying geometry is a language of all languages, because in some sense, all of the linguistic simulation comes down to how the person has accepted as a separation. The ropes of hope are the attempts of human beings to advance civilization. You start off in your own room first. You, you live in just your world at first. The, all children are like this. This is why you have to be very uh, graceful with children, yet not lie to them. Right? It's as if the parent doesn't realize in every communication with the child, they're, they are in some sense giving the child a program to decide whether they want to act upon or not. A human being gets caught in an inefficient condition. That means their intelligence or the awareness and alertness of their moment has not been able to read out the condition properly and so they're found in an inefficient moment. An inefficient moment means a moment where the percentage of chaotic behavior has increased. Uh, the, the percentage of chaotic behavior implies to the free will what it does not have control over. And you see, freedom is all about the free, free will's control. The free will is saying, I am here. I am not a, a slave to the past. I am not a slave to what the future has to be. I am this living moment, yet as I live, I see the past and future walk beside me. I see wh where all this can go and if we choose to be active. Trust me, so many people, their intelligence is inactive. It's not that they're not intelligent. It's just they are, it's inactive. They don't care. They, they are convinced by a boring story of the world and they live routine mechanical lives where it's as if they're not tired of a loop. <clears throat> that's the thing. Some people so, sometimes see me as intense, but that's because I, 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 I have disliked the repetition uh, and in some sense I have found novelty to be divine. The world is so magnificent that I don't feel any person can do anything wrong. They are just a design of nature fundamentally. This design of nature now interprets itself. Now what that means is because there is a sort of hollowness to our knowledge, uh, <laughs> because it's like we're on a rock in the middle of nowhere and we've just stood. What does, a, what does a being do in emptiness? You see, it is the dismantling of the noun and the verb. It is contentment with all. That's it. With all. You see, I care for hu humanity, yet I can see that you give, you give a person too much and they can overload.
there are certain things I, I consider that you can, I can, you can see how healthy a civilization is or how evolved it is. It has to do with how the governance of the civilization acknowledges the value of what it is governing. If you think people are sheep, you will be like a kind of ignorant shepherd. If you think that people are lions, you will roar in a way where you will hear the roar of the 10,000 lions, you know, the roar of 10,000 galaxies at once. Words that have found me often, rise, mankind, rise. We have to plant seeds of designs and these designs will be games for the future to play where in, in these simple games they will attain a complex comprehension of how the world has appeared so far. The world, because it has a known side and an unknown side, the known side can never be convinced and the unknown side can never be, in some sense, uh, given attributes. It's as if the word being, when you think of the word B-E-I-N-G, what thought comes to you? Can it be just a thought? Or does it have to do with how the macrocosm holds the microcosm? Or is it just how the microcosm holds the macrocosm? Uh, what I mean by that is that human beings are valuing the world in their own way, then living in it, rather than seeing the world was something that was here before them. The world, we are a guest in this world. When you have that attitude, you won't want too much, you won't want too little. You know, every moment becomes as if you, you are the gift of your intelligence. It's like the child woke up and said, existence, what have you to show me now? And the world turned. There's this very incredible story <clears throat> There's this really incredible story about an imperial warrior It's a Zen story And this imperial warrior, imagine like he has imperial samurai kind of gear and he's this undefeated warrior in battle. He has been over 70 battles and he has been undefeated. Literally, he's been in battles where his army has been very few and his men have for, uh, given, off, like, given up hope. But they saw this one warrior still fighting the army of the enemy. And so eventually the men gained like, holy shit, this dude's still fighting. Let's fight. You know, like that kind of mentality. So he's this undefeated warrior imperial warrior and he has a big ego it's like he's not going at it like i'm a humble person he's going at it i am the god of war i am this moment's kind of expression of war you know so what happens is this warrior he has killed many he has he has discontinued many beings and manifestation one day after like his 70th, 70th war, he begins to suddenly think, okay, I'm getting older. Where are all these people I'm killing going? And suddenly the question arises, what is heaven? What is hell? Will he go to heaven or will he go to hell? the judgment of the conscience uh, uh, visits him. And so what happens this imperial warrior looks at his assistant and says find me the ultimate sage, the wisest man. And just by him giving the command, the assistant's like okay, <laughs> the assistant knows what kind of warrior he is, he's like okay instantly, yeah. And the assistant goes and talks to the townspeople and does some street smart things and eventually finds out that there's a sage on top of the specific mountain above the clouds or whatever. He tells the warrior the location and the mountain and the sage is like, I will go myself. You know, and he just like, like a juggernaut robot walks. 
walks away. <laughs> and so what happens is suddenly this warrior, imperial warrior, and the Japanese samurai had two swords. They carry two swords, you know. These two swords, just a quick note I'm going to say, could be like the backup uh, global efficiency. <laughs> but anyways, <clears throat> this samurai kind of imperial warrior finds himself at the door of this monastery. He just slams the door open and walks in and literally juggernaut like... <laughs> He's like this, that, that's how heavy his ego is. And uh, so he goes. He goes and he suddenly finds <clears throat> there's his end master there drinking tea. And beside him there are like four to five disciples also drinking tea. They're in a drinking Zen, Zen tea drinking ceremony. This warrior goes in and says like as if he has no concern for what's happening in the monastery. He just bat charges in and says, Sage. <clears throat> and the Zen master looks at him, says, Sage, tell me now, what is heaven and hell? And as if he's giving a command to his soldier, one of his soldiers, that's how intensely and furiously he speaks to the sage. The sage takes a sip from his tea and pretty much looks at this guy and says that, um, you're too much of a dumbass, too much of a goon to, in some sense, uh, uh, understand the answer. He kind of insults the guy, this imperial warrior. And obviously his armor is imperial, so people know who he is. The sage, uh, the warrior looks at this sage and in his mind he's like, what did you say? And he's, it's as if with the most ultimate rage and just to, as if like he's on the battlefield. He takes his sword, his sword and he's about to, in some sense, kill the sage. And as the sword, as if he's decided the death of this being before the, anything else, you know, and as his sword is moving, Moving and about to hit the head, head of the sage, the sage takes another sip from his tea. <laughs> or coffee. <laughs> and um, sage looks at this man and smiles. He has this calm smile as if disconcerned for ignorance is reality. And he looks at this guy before this, and the sword's literally moving. The, sword, the sage sees, is seeing the sword coming down on his head. And he looks at this warrior and says, this is hell. And some force in the hand of this warrior makes his hand stop right before the blade hits this guy's head. And his hand slowly comes back and he sheathes the sword automatically. And he just stands there. And suddenly a wave of a cognition hits him. He realizes hell is a state of mind. It's just the way the attention is, is moving. He drops his sword and for the first time in, in like, as if never this has happened, he bows. It's like only he's bowed to the king once. This warrior bows to the sage. And the sage and the warrior suddenly is like as if he's bowing. When he's bowing, he's putting down his ego. He's putting his ego aside. And he bows to the sage. And the sage looks at him and says, This is heaven. How many years do we want to remain animalistic? Why not change the conditions of the animal nature? That means technology begins to recreate environments of great physical activity. Literally, rather than people fighting in the streets, they are in some sense playing a sport of financial compensation. The thing is, the species doesn't understand this. The species really doesn't understand this. Money is an invention. Just this is how historically it's defined. It's something that wasn't there. Suddenly, people, after bartering for many years, suddenly brought forth currency. From from trading things with one another, off like somebody had like um, chair, the other had like um, 
like a bowl of soup and they trade it. <laughs> <laughs> like that was, that was a sort of trade. And then eventually currency came in. And suddenly currency was like the ego of value. We began measuring things. <sighs> Anyways, guys, I hope this talk has served you. Um, that Zen story was pretty much to point out that you got to be aware of your state of mind. Your state of mind is pretty much how much your attention from the moment you wake up is bringing the world forth. And the mind is where something very subtle and something very unknown and incredible. The mind is so profound that when we dream, I've had personally dreams where in the dreams I've moved, I wanted to go left, I went left, I wanted to go right, I went right. I, I was running at an incredibly fast speed that was not humanly possible. Like I, I never ran at that speed. And in, in the dream, I was functioning like that, okay? But I woke up from the dream <clears throat> astonished uh, as I uh, kind of stood beside my bed. Like I just kind of, you know, put my hands over my head and I'm like, what is this? And I suddenly realized that the mind is so able that even when the physical body is inactive, the free will has an existence, has a subjective existence. So it made me suddenly see as if I thought my body came first, then my mind. It suddenly made me realize it's as if the mind is a field in which this particle moves in, this body moves in. This field can be given stories. It has been for many years, you know. <clears throat> but it is simply the elegance of how nature is present here before we define it. This natural intelligence is not lost, is not caged to a story. It is the pure natural presence and freedom of the attention. And then you function from there on. You utilize language like a technology. You evoke it at various times. Language in some sense is just design. You're just looking at a lot of symbols that reflect a lot of real things. This is why they say any person who wants to study any field, any branch of knowledge, just go study the words. I'm not kidding. Literally go see how scientists are talking and you will suddenly see the worlds they're seeing behind their eyes. And that one world will be a conclusion. <sighs> Thanks for tuning in, guys. Much blessings and I was Rise, mankind, rise. That is the only task ahead.